It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Dean Nelson Hibschman of the Pratt Institute. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Henry T. Heald, Chancellor of New York University. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Dr. Heald, it's a pleasure to have so distinguished an educator as you tonight on the chronoscope. Uh, I believe, sir, that you've been president of New York University uh, for only about six months, isn't that correct, sir? Yes, I came to New York University in February, Mr. Huey. And prior to that, uh, you were in Chicago, weren't you? I was in Chicago as president of Illinois Institute of Technology. And uh, to complete uh, your story, I believe you're a native of Nebraska. That's correct. Well, sir, uh, I suppose that uh, uh, a man who is president of what I believe is the largest university in the world, or one of the largest, that one of your problems uh, is the problem of uh, military training today. Uh, isn't that correct, sir? Military, the problem of military training is a problem that faces every young man in the, uh, in the country and, of course, faces college students. Well, what is the attitude toward those uh, two years now that a young man must, uh, must give to the military? Uh, is there resentment toward it on college campuses? I think there's no uh, no resentment toward it. I think the college students of the country, uh, like uh, all the rest of us, are not very enthusiastic about a set of world conditions which require that we have to maintain a large military force, but nevertheless realize it has to be done. How many young Americans are in college now, Dr. Hill? Well, uh, our total college enrollment this fall will probably run uh, 2,400,000 men and women. And what percentage of that, uh, of people of college age, is that, sir? Well, of the people of the college age group, that perhaps represents one-sixth of the total population of that, of that age group. And in uh, short, to one American out of six uh, who is of college age is now going to college, and five out of six are not going to college. That's probably a rough approximation, I should say. Uh, would you say that that's uh, too many Americans in college? Well, the percentage of our population uh, going to college has steadily increased every year since 1900. Uh, we are, of course, at a higher percentage there than we've been before, but uh, I don't think it's too many. Well, there's a great shortage of engineering and scientific personnel today. What is being done about that, Dr. Hill? Well, the engineering societies and the employers of engineers and everyone else interested in that problem is trying to make it clear to young people that this is a field uh, which offers opportunity uh, for qualified uh, young men. Is it true that uh, every engineer and graduate today has the choice of a dozen or so jobs? Well, certainly there's great competition for all of the engineering graduates today. Uh, well, that, uh, what, what causes that, sir? Is it, uh, is it a, f a, a f decline in the, in the uh, supply or is it an increase in the demand for engineers? It's caused by both. Uh, there has been a, uh, a considerable decline in the supply because of smaller freshman enrollments in the last uh, three or four or five years. And of course, the uh, high level of employment and the defense program and uh, mobilization uh, is taking a uh, very large uh, number of engineers. Well, you are, of course, a distinguished engineer yourself, sir. Uh, is it a sign of the times that uh, an engineer like yourself has been chosen as uh, president of the largest university in the country? Well, uh, engineering is important, but uh, I suspect that I was uh, chosen because it's a uh, because of the shortage of university presidents. <laughs> With the rising costs of higher education and the general feeling that it should be available to all, uh, some people think that higher education should be subsidized by federal funds. How do you feel about that? Well, I, in general, uh, I think uh, higher education should not be subsidized by federal funds, but then uh, uh, there are a good many qualifications which one has to apply because higher education for individuals, such as the veterans, is subsidized by, uh, by federal funds. Well, it's been uh, on that, sir. Uh, it's now been seven years since the end of the Second World War. 
And I know that our viewers were, uh, would be interested in your opinions uh, as to what, uh, what, what's a proper judgment of the uh, government's large-scale entry into the field of paying for education. Well, I think almost all of the educators, and certainly uh, some uh, millions of uh, young men who have taken advantage of that, would conclude that uh, the expenditures for, as an aid for GI education have been well justified. Are the Korean veterans returning to college now? Korean veterans are uh, returning, but in very small numbers. The uh, total number of uh, veterans demobilized there isn't very great, and uh, uh, I would guess that only a relative handful will be enrolled in this fall term. Now, uh, uh, how is inflation affecting cost in college? How much does it cost uh, an average uh, young American to go to NYU uh, for a year now, sir? Well, it uh, varies, uh, but uh, if he has to pay board and room and uh, living expenses and tuition, perhaps uh, a couple of thousand dollars is a f per year is a fair figure. About two thousand dollars a year for the man who has to pay uh, pay board and room. Now, uh, what's the uh, size of the student body at uh, New York University, sir? New York University has about 45,000 students, full-time and part-time, in all of its various branches and divisions. And how is it supported? Is it state-supported? It's not state-supported. This uh, university uh, was founded more than 120 years ago as a privately supported, privately endowed university. It has never well, had any state support. Your experience in Chicago at the Illinois Institute of Technology was such as to indicate that uh, you were able to bring education and industry together. How do you feel about the responsibility of industry for the educational, the private educational uh, institutions in its community? Well, I think uh, industry, uh, corporations, businesses, uh, have a uh, responsibility for citizenship, uh, which extends into the area of education, just as I think education has a responsibility to business and industry. Uh, there's a mutuality of interest, and uh, uh, there are a great many areas in which they can cooperate, one of which, of course, is in the problem of support for private higher education in order to make sure that it'll be strong and continue to be, uh, take its rightful place in the total educational structure. You, you mentioned, Dr. Hill, that uh, New York University is supported by gifts. Now, uh, how are taxes affecting those gifts today? Are, how much money was given to the university last year? Well, the university last year received gifts of uh, a little more than six million uh, dollars. A it? fairly sizable sum, but not very large compared to the size of the university. Well, are, are gifts falling off, or, or was that six million an increase over previous it years? It happens that that was an increase, but uh, the university's need is also increasing. In all privately supported educational institutions have that factor in common. And that, uh, I believe, is one of the things, one of the chores that the presidents of these institutions has, isn't it? Uh, to uh, help raise money and to induce people to give money to schools. Well, that's one of the problems that presidents have. There's no doubt about that. Dr. Uh, Hill, do you see a future for uh, television in education as a tool of general education? Television is, uh, is one of the most exciting uh, uh, tools uh, that has been made available to education. Most of us haven't discovered exactly how to use it yet. Do you think the universities and colleges will make wide use of the opportunities uh, afforded by the FCC, for instance, in this uh, new allocation of the UHF? The universities and colleges of the country are tremendously interested in it. They have the practical problem of uh, first how to, uh, uh, how to find money enough to get the uh, stations on the air, and then after they get stations on the air of, uh, of uh, supporting the programs. I'm sure our viewers would like your comment on this, sir. Uh, it's been said that college students today are considerably more serious-minded than they were in the past. Uh, do you think that's true? Well, I think college students uh, are somewhat more serious-minded than they have been in the past. Certainly that was true uh, of all of the veterans uh, that we had, and that's conditioned the uh, uh, students in the years since the veterans. And pursuing that same thought, it's also been said that, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, young men have been criticized from some directions 
for being uh, more security conscious today than they were in the past. Uh, someone has jokingly said that the young man is more interested in the pension plan of some business now than he is in how much money he receives at the start or what his opportunities are. Is it fair to say that they are more security conscious today? Well, I'm afraid this whole country has been somewhat uh, uh, conditioned to be more, to more security conscious, but uh, I see no particular evidence that it, that is uh, limited to uh, college students. As a matter of fact, I see a good deal of evidence that uh, college students uh, are still interested in the same kind of things that they were uh, a good many years ago when I went to college. <laughs> uh, you don't think that it's a proper indictment of the young people today? Certainly it's no indictment of the young people. It may be an indictment of, uh, of our older people as well. Well, uh, Dr. Heald, uh, I believe it was uh, Mr. H.G. Wells who said one time that civilization is a race between uh, education and catastrophe. Uh, I'm sure that many of our viewers uh, have an idea that catastrophe is winning in this days of the atom bomb. Now, uh, what would, would you care to predict as to whether education is going to be able to defeat catastrophe in our time? Well, of course, there's no question that what uh, we face uh, extremely difficult and uh, complicated problems today. But I'm perfectly confident that uh, education uh, will win that race. I'm perfectly sure that the kind of young people, uh, young men and young women, whom we have in our colleges and universities today, uh, will be capable of uh, solving these problems, which sometimes look a little insurmountable to us. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Dean Nelson Hibschman. Our distinguished guest, was Dr. Henry T. Heald, Chancellor of New York University. The traditional gift to symbolize achievement, honor, or respect is a watch of truly great prestige. And the watch of greatest prestige for every presentation purpose is Longines, the world's most honored watch. Now, throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines for no other watch has won 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 gold medals for excellence and elegance, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. For your personal use, for any gift occasion, as well as for formal presentation, a Longines watch brings unique satisfaction, for into every Longines watch is built the greater accuracy and longer life for which Longines watches are world honored. And yet, you may buy and own, or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.